along Director of Willistown Conservation Trust Community Farm Program. And uh, usually this time of year, we're socializing, we're outside, we're together. And um, obviously, unfortunately, this year, things are a little bit different. We still are having contact on the farm. People are coming out. And the foremost thing I want to say is that uh, I hope that everybody takes the opportunity to get outdoors, enjoy the spring, enjoy what's going on, and visit one of the Willstown Conservation Trust Preserves, whether it's Ashbridge Preserve, Kirkwood, or Rushton, where we have the farm going, um, where we're really trying to do our best to, to maintain um, what we've done every year for the last 13 years. Um, the community farm program is something that is really for everyone. You can come out, you can talk with the farmers, you can see um, the farm existing and moving every single day in all different ways that we're all feeling in our bodies at the end of every single day. <laughs> um, and, and I really just want to thank this incredible staff that we have that is here. Um, Noah and Molly, particularly, who started up first thing, Caitlin, who jumped in right after that, and Eloise, who just showed up this week. Um, with that, I would like each of them to introduce themselves. Um, we're going to start with Noah, who's farmed with me for the last 20 years and uh, has really been the force that has helped make Rushton what it is today. Oh, thanks, Fred. <laughs> Hi, I'm Noah Gress. Uh, I'm the uh, field manager here at Rushton and I've uh, been here for uh, I think my 10th season. We'll, we'll call it ninth or 10th season. It, time just moves along, you know, it's just spring again, I suppose. And uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed creating and helping grow this farm. And especially this year, uh, you know, it's really been, it really feels good to be out here. And it feels like, you know, we're, we're, we're being able to do something to help people and to maintain some continuity in, in the world. And that I'll turn over to Molly. I'm Molly, Molly Clark. Um, I'm the uh, field the production, you know, I'm the production manager. manager. <laughs> <laughs> we wear a lot of different hats. Yeah. 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 Um, this is this will be my fifth season at Rushton. Um, I love the work. I love it here. I really think I've learned a lot, and especially this year, I'm picking up on on a lot with just uh, the you know the beginning of the season, just being Fred Noah and I. Um, getting a lot done. It's really felt like a huge accomplishment so far. Um, it's been, and like Noah said, it's been really nice. Um, just having this in, and, and I guess it's the accomplishment thing too, just saying like, we can still come here, we can still grow food for our, our community. Um, and that's really satisfying. So even, even on days like yesterday, <laughs> um, it just is, it's, it's satisfying work. Hi everybody, my name's Caitlin. Many of you are, maybe if you were a part of the uh, flappy hour we had a few weeks ago, you saw me with the bird team. That's how I first got introduced to Rushton. I was a student of Fred and Lisa's uh, in the Master of Environmental Studies program at Penn. And I probably spent um, at least three full seasons supporting the bird program, first as a volunteer, um, now more as a, a banding assistant, I suppose. and. Um, at least a few of those years. One, two, this would be my second season with the farm, spread multiple years apart, <laughs> needling Fred and asking for more experience and the opportunity to sweat along with everyone else. Um, yeah, I am very grateful to, you know, be a part of the team and get to help, um, you know, like Molly, and Molly said, so, you know, support, support the community and um, help things grow. Yeah, grow some food. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I guess that's me. My name's uh, Eloise Gare. Uh, I'm almost done with my very first week. So that's very <laughs> exciting and a sweaty week it has been. <laughs> um, I have a uh, horticulture background. I just finished up a year at the Morris Arboretum as the Rose Garden intern, which primed me really well for this job because there's no shade there either. Um, <laughs> but I'm um, excited to grow some food and to, you know, experience the kind of learning curve that this is going to be for me. I'm trying to be very sponge-like <laughs> and learn as much as I possibly can. And I'm very lucky to have um, such knowledgeable people who are showing me what's up. So I can't wait to get going. The great thing about Eloise is she's also a writer too. And uh, we have not had another 
creative writer on staff. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Um, <laughs> Zing. Just, <laughs> I'm waiting for the owl to acknowledge me. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You, you can keep going. I'll say <laughs> No, I just, uh, it's, I've never had somebody um, with a resume send in a sci fi piece. Uh, that, oh, God. I can't it was very good. That. It's, um, but, you know, I think that lends itself to the creative talents that we have here. All of us. Noah was a commercial fisherman. Um, Molly likes purple. And, uh, <laughs> I had horse wrinkle on my resume. Okay. <laughs> but it, it, it has been really a dynamic first part of our season. And um, it's been one of the best early seasons that I have experienced, probably because I've had to actually work again, which I kind of missed, kind of. Um, <laughs> but I kind of want to talk about um, how the farm starts. I, I love it every year when um, people say, uh, what did you do with your entire winter? And realizing that uh, our season starts in January, um, we spend a lot of our winter on the farm and with the greenhouses getting started up in February. So with that, I'm just gonna do a uh, short presentation, kind of going over some of the finer points of how we start and what we're about. Um, I mean, the first seed catalog does show up in November and that one, we have an unwritten rule, goes right into the wood stove. And then they send us another one in, in December and then we start looking through and getting ready for the next year. But the garlic's the hook. You know, we plant the garlic in the fall, so that always makes it so we've got to come back to again for back. another year. In, our, in, in October, oh, right around Columbus Day, we all start the coming back. In. <laughs> and then once the garlic's in, we know that we'll see everybody next year again. <laughs> And we definitely shanghai well, Thanks, Play Meg, Play for the shout out. Eloise got a shout out. Welcome to the farm. Aww, <laughs> thank you, Meg. So. Uh, I think, Lindsay, did you see my message? Maybe. <laughs> you should be good to go. <laughs> thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 Sorry, we're moving around here. It's The, you know, the preserve is really nice right now. And one of the things that's kind of funny is that the wildlife is really encroaching on civilization during this pandemic. I know the birders have seen a lot of extraordinary birds this year, the ones that are out recreationally in the woods. And, and just yesterday at about 4.30, the vultures were flying over our heads in, <laughs> in tight cylindrical circles, you know, wondering if we were gonna make it out by five or not. <laughs> Not yeah, dead yet. Yeah, I'm not dead yet. All right, team, <laughs> if we leave you, it, it, it is but briefly in order for me to be able to share my screen. So give me one moment. Close up or something. Make sure we're good to go. Yay! Yay. All right, so we're going to just take a quick look at kind of what's going on from the beginning of uh, the end of winter through spring and how we kind of evolve to the point where you see us now. Come on, Techie. <laughs> this was one on my year quickly. <laughs> oh, 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 there it is. There we go. Yeah, I see. You can't yeah. write. You can't do text. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> well, I hope everyone sees my <laughs> eye rising in the form of a beet red bush. All right. <laughs> oh, there we go. There's a there's there a, you go. There's a crop reference we'll I was trying to think. Yeah. So uh, oh, I just beet red. Eventually, hey. this PowerPoint will turn up. Fred, <laughs> oh. <laughs> hurry. At least it's not that. <laughs> um, so uh, let us continue. Let's continue. <laughs> so um, we're just going to kind of touch on some of the stuff, as I said. I just wanted to start off with Henry's garden because Sarah Hutchin has done such a great job over the years developing that garden and uh, helping to fuel our donation program. Share the Bounty program is a major part of what we do. Uh, we try to generate at least 3,000 to 4,000 pounds of food, which represents about 15% of what we grow. And Sarah's garden helps contribute to that. Uh, this year we're expanding the garden. I think with food needs being what they are, that it's important to really start looking at what we're doing with our land and where that food is going. Um, Maybe. Yeah, please. Uh, Russian farm, this is what it looks like in 
cartoon form uh, <laughs> when we're going, this is what it looks like the overhead. This is us in full production. And this is what most people are used to, being able to come out, being able to visit the farm, engage in the farm, walk the field, see the gardens. Um, but this is, this is how we start. Uh, not this season, but in past seasons, you see the snow. Um, we really do start in winter and it starts with um, our seeds. And so over the years, it's always been the production manager's job to kind of pull together what our seed order is and how we're going to go about figuring out what crops to put in, doing a crop plan, the crop rotation, and understanding really what we want to grow and how we want to grow it. And that is a really difficult thing that takes a lot of time. And this year, Molly and Chelsea, Chelsea kind of handed it off to Molly. And um, then Noah and I engage and put our two cents in, which is usually ignored. Um, and then we have to order seeds later in the season. But it is nice when this big box shows up with thousands, tens of thousands of seeds. You open it up and you feel like, okay, the season's coming. As Noah talked about, throwing out the first seed catalog is kind of a tradition, but when the seeds come in, that's the start of the season. The seeds. And this is the first vision that you get is when you show up to that greenhouse door on a cold February morning and you look in, you're like, oh God, there's going to be life there at some point. But right now I got to clean that place up, sterilize it, get it in the best condition possible. That is there, it's this year more so than ever. It was just really going in there with everything going on. It was just really thinking about working alongside people, social distancing, swirling fans, and how to deal with all that. And uh, it turned out to be quite successful. As you can see, we're set up. Um, and then the soil arrived. And I always talk about the Vermont compost because people always ask why we bring in outside soil to start our plants. Uh, Vermont compost I've worked with for over 20 years. And it's just, when you're organic, you can't add fertilizer to your seedlings. You need to trust that the soil that you have is the best soil possible. And um, Lisa and I have visited Vermont Compost. I've talked to them extensively. And from the beginning of Russian Farm, we've used them because we've trusted that our starts are going to be able to get the best start forward um, with, with the nutrients that are within that soil. And that seedlings health is the most important thing to us having a good season. Hi, Max. Um, and here's where I saw Molly for about two straight months in the back <laughs> corner. Noah's in the left corner off to the side, but Molly just sat back there seating. I, I can't overemphasize, especially this season, that um, for this greenhouse, every single little green shoot you see right there that was a seed that went into a cell that then grew and it is i can't do it anymore it just drives me nuts it just it's it's painstakingly just seed after seed and then you turn into noah and you go ocd about <laughs> them dying or frying or uh what's going to happen once they start growing and that is continuous through the entirety of the spring and this is Noah almost killing himself going for a workman's comp claim. Yeah. Um, and then there's the moving around. They surfing. start to grow. I was break dancing, Fred. You see me break dancing. It looks like Come on. surfing the waves of green. <laughs> it's, it's you're moving Twisted. stuff around. And, yeah. Um, yeah, greenhouse twister. Yeah. <laughs> and as you're picking them up and moving and trying to figure out what needs water, what needs to get off heat mass, what needs to get on heat mass, it's just a continuous. Uh, movement within that greenhouse, whether it's moving trays, whether it's watering, whether it's uh, taking stuff out, putting stuff in. Um, it's, it's just something that evolves. It really is. It really does get you set for the season when you start having to pull stuff out and put them in the field. And here we go with the field. Um, so then you get into, this is a little later than March, but <laughs> March is when we start to till. And, uh, you know, so these are the first fields. This is what you see. And this is me almost running over Molly. Um, also so, happened in reverse one time. <laughs> yeah, almost happened in reverse one time. Uh, so, yeah, so for us, when you talk about amendments to the soil, a lot of people talk about composting. Well, 
the degree of compost that we would need to put nutrients into our farm is just, it's acres and acres. I mean, you just need so much. So Noah actually, as what he brought to us was a real understanding of the nutrients that are needed to grow food. And um, he has really developed a complex set of organic amendments, um, ranging from green sand to potassium to kelp um, to fish emulsion. Um, these are things that all go into the soil ahead of that. So what you see Molly doing is spreading the fertilizer in front of me, um, in front of before we lay down our uh, mulch. And this is our mulch. So the mulch film is actually corn straw starch and it's biodegradable. It's not plastic, it looks like plastic, but we have an actual layer that was behind that tractor that pulls the mulch over and then furrows soil on top of the mulch um, to put it down. Now this helps us in many ways. First of all, uh, there's a drip, drip tape underneath that. So we irrigate underneath that, which helps the moisture to stay within the soil and not evaporate. Um, the black mulch also helps us to be able to warm the soil to help protect the seedlings. It helps us keep weeds down. This is really an amazing thing. And it used to be non-biodegradable plastic. Um, now it is biodegradable. And we did not use uh, anything in the first few years of the farm because we didn't think the, uh, the, the, the breakdown was appropriate for the um, mulch, that it wasn't breaking down fast enough. But they've really perfected at this point. It's Omri approved to overseas organic standards and um, it goes really well. I will say, if you see our fencing around there, um, that is our deer fencing. So each field is fenced off uh, with electric fence. We bait it early on with peanut butter. Um, and the deer come in, they actually touch it, they get shocked and they move off. We fence each field individually so that the deer can continue to move through the fields um, and not have to jump the fence, in which case they would go into the crops and recognize that there is a smorgasbord of food to be eaten. Um, it has been very successful for us over the years. Here's the beginning planning. So these, this is the first planning. Uh, this photo was, um, it was contraband. It was taken away by Noah who said, there's no social distancing in this picture. <laughs> this is March and I actually wanted Eliza to uh, Instagram this. And then I realized, oh Christ, now I'm gonna have to hear about everybody's social distancing. The reality is we've been self-isolated, really contained ourselves. We agreed from the beginning that we would not be in complete contact with stores and other people. And this is unfortunately, it's just the reality of what has to be done. And it's the same thing now with masks. I mean, we're being very safe, very careful, but it's a farm. You have to work and you have to be near each other. And that is part of the love of the farm and part of the beauty of what we do. And this is a much larger planting. <laughs> and um, this is the potato planting. Uh, we call it steaks and potatoes. You're going to see the steaks in a second. Um, it, it seems to happen at the same time that the first tomatoes are staked around the first time the potatoes are planted, and both of them are excruciating. Um, Noah's going to speak to this, uh, the ProTech. Okay, this is a, a new, you may see, you may have seen the, um, uh, something in the past called floating row cover that we use uh, in, in addition to um, uh, this new product here, which is called ProTech. And both of those things, well, the floating row cover adds a bit of frost protection, and early on it keeps the seedlings um, growing and comfortable. It's sort of a mini greenhouse, if you will. Um, this new item called ProTech, uh, it, it's a more of a mesh, so it allows us to see the crops. The biggest thing is that it lets a lot of the moisture that evaporates out of the soil away from the crop, so it actually is increasing crop health for us. And uh, one of the main reasons we use it during the season is for insect uh, prevention, or, in, or in, integrated pest, it's an integrated pest management technique that we use here on the farm. Rather than having to chase bugs around the farm with an organic approved pesticide, we have um, developed this technique, although it's a bit arduous in the beginning, burying all this stuff, especially on windy days or rainy days in the early spring. Once we tuck it under this um, insect mesh, 
we can be, be pretty assured that the plants will be able to get large enough without uh, the bugs bothering them that once they begin to burst out of their little tunnels there, we can open them up and the, uh, the, the actual biomass of the plant will be able to resist the minimal insect damage that it gets later on in the season. So we'll use this for, mainly we started with um, cucumbers and winter squash and watermelons and cantaloupe to keep beetles off it. They have tons of little bacteria in their, their mandibles. Um, but, but recently, um, just to show that, you know, what we really, we try to really keep ahead of what's going on and we really try to um, implement some sort of agroecology techniques by learning the life cycle of the insects. And just recently, over the last couple of years, we've had an allium leaf miner that jumped across the Atlantic and landed here in the United States. And unfortunately, it bothers garlic in the early spring. So even in the beginning, when the garlic emerges in the spring, we'll use this insect netting on top of it. And the first year that we didn't, we noticed we lost almost 30% of the crop. Once we implemented this um, using this mesh, we don't have any problem with it at all. And then in subsequent years, we've noticed that that particular pest has not really become a problem on our farm. And although we have some of it around, it's never in a great enough numbers to affect the onions and scallions that we also grow. Thanks. And here's the steaks. So uh, you can see Noah going at it with a steak pounder. Uh, we got Trip in there too and everyone else. Um, I guess Caitlin's in there somewhere probably doing nothing. <laughs> I was working on my memoir. I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and boy, is it creative. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I love chapter six. So, um, yes, yeah, so this really, I, it just, it's the most physical time of year. And it's just a, this exasperation where you put in a six foot steak, the men have to lift a 40 pound pounder over top and slam it into the ground um, and do and that. Above mm -hmm. your head. I said, a not your head. Oh, you're not your head, which <laughs> Noah has almost knocked himself out <laughs> using that. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is just, this is, this is what we're doing up until, until, Sorry. <laughs> until the harvest. So here we go where the crops are starting to come in. We're starting to harvest. We've gotten a lot of the stuff in and it's continuous. We'll be planting seeding um, throughout the course of the season. Um, but this is where we really start seeing the fruits of our labor. And uh, here's little Camilla Gowan, who is now a freshman in college. Oh That's how old I am. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the peas are about to come in. Uh, we chose the peas first thing this morning. Um, you know, it's, the peas are such a great thing because they're an early crop that we plant. They come in, it's a harvest, and then people can go out and actually engage and harvest themselves. And um, that's something of trying to, to connect people with the food that they're eating and for them to be able to pick their own food this early uh, I think is really important. Yeah one of the things we we feel really good about is like um, uh, like the, the slide you just saw some of the, the children whose parents and families have been members for almost 10 years now think their food comes from a farm and not a grocery store and that's something that you know we, we think is a real achievement on a, 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 a agro, socio agro level. Yeah, and, and yeah, and part of it also is talking about diversity of vegetables and what we grow. And here's some examples, some of the heirloom tomatoes that we grow. Heirlooms are basically tomatoes that have not been uh, genetically changed in a way that makes them more uniform. Everybody talks about the Jersey tomato. The first Jersey tomato is the Rutgers tomato, Ooh. which was created for um, Campbell Soup Company, and I actually consider that an heirloom because it, it's an older tomato that really kept its integrity. But over the years, uh, a lot of tomatoes and a lot of vegetables in particular have been bred so that they can travel, so that they can store, and that takes a lot of the nutrients out of them. It takes a lot of the um, components that made them a great vegetable in the first place. So when we go back to our heirloom varieties, we're going back to what was the original flavor and texture and everything that made vegetables good that I think a lot of the reason that people got a, a 
opposed to certain vegetables is because they lost their flavor. Um, so we have colors too. These are our potatoes. You got the magic mollies. Um, you got the, <laughs> uh, we actually have two varieties of purples in there. We have the Peru Peruvian Peru and the magic molly. Um, and then we got some Yukon golds and some Norland reds. You know, really showing, especially with kids, being able to show different colors and different shapes. I mean, it's just that the food experience, that's how I got into food, was just being able to see different foods on a regular basis. When you stick processed and already completed dishes in front of them and don't engage kids in actually cooking and using vegetables, I think that's what really makes kids somewhat aloof when it comes to actually understanding the food that they eat. And again, you have the colors and the textures. We had to have a purple picture in there. Um, <laughs> but you know, you can see how fresh those onions are. They were just literally pulled, and the skins were pulled. But uh, you know, they're just—they're—they're they're just. It's a different type of food. Oh, you can skip that. Oh. I don't know. And so we talk about all this with the production of food and growing food. And then we bring it all back to why we're Russian farm and what's different about us. And for us, it's being part of Wellstone Conservation Trust. It's connecting people to the land. It's getting people out onto the land, engaging the land in all different ways, whether it's birds, whether it's watershed, whether it's land conservation, stewardship. These are all the areas we want to look at. And for us here at Russian, I think we touch on all of them. Um, you can see in the upper left, uh, Travis Price, one of our first interns, our first agroecology intern, which is a student who was looking at both the farm and the environment um, and seeing how the two interconnected. Um, he's holding a burden. You can see the, the excitement on his face at dealing with that. And on the lower right, um, you can see kids harvesting potatoes and engaging in that. And this is what we want to do is connect people with the land. And for me, it started with a turtle. Uh, Rushton, where we are now, where we're literally sitting, started because I was on a bike ride as a child on Goshen Road, I shouldn't say child, teenager, and I came across a box turtle crossing uh, Goshen Road. I picked that box turtle up, there was a stone wall, I put it on the other side. I had no idea what was on the other side of that wall. Um, years, years later, when I came and as a consultant of Wellstown Conservation Trust, I uh, totally wanted to know what was on the other side of that wall. And they said this was a place that we could start a farm, that we could lease the land. We had conserved land right next to, uh, with the Willstown, Con uh, Rushton Curve was right next to our farm property, what would become Rushton Farm. And uh, so I looked at this place. You couldn't even come in here at the time. There was no access. We came in, we looked at it, and we established Russian Farm, and it has become what it is. Um, and every time I see a box turtle, I've seen four of them on this property this year, I just think about the possibility that maybe it's my box turtle. Um, in reality, though, I just, you can see a lot of life happening, as Noah mentioned. And I will mention one thing about the box turtles. The most fascinating thing I ever saw was uh, when we were digging up sweet potatoes and found two blue eggs. And at the time, uh, we thought they were snake eggs. And Todd Oliver, um, former agroecology bird farm person, um, <laughs> took them home and decided to hatch them. And one of them came out as a box turtle. And he released it back into the woods. And I just, I think this, the fact that these box turtles were nesting and laying eggs and sweet potatoes told you that agriculture an ecosystem can coexist quite well. And this is the perfect case in point. This is a famous story. These songbirds were sitting in our tomatoes and Noah and I didn't know what to do. So we just left them there. And Lisa Kieshuk, director of our bird conservation program, it's like, just leave them alone, leave them alone, leave them alone. So we did, and then they fledged one rainy day when we're trying to harvest the tomatoes. They go onto the ground and Noah and I start trying to jamming back into the nest. And I just remember me running up to the farm shed and calling Lisa and being like, these birds fell out of the nest, which is not the right thing to tell Lisa. She's <laughs> like, you idiot. She's like, they're supposed to be out of the nest. 
And so I run back down to tell Noah, and he had tucked him under an eggplant leaf uh, <laughs> to keep him dry. And uh, oddly enough, these these songbirds uh, evidently were um, banded uh, either that year or the following year. And that started our understanding that we were much more than a farm, that we were a habitat, and we need to really understand what we're doing with our habitat um, if we're going to farm. Which brings us to bees. Uh, pollinators have always been a, a huge part of Russian farm. Understanding them, looking at them, studying them, and recognizing that everything we do is reliant on them. Um, this is a swarm uh, that Noah's going to talk about in a second. Oh, no. Uh, out of order. No, we'll talk about after this picture, which is the um, Carolina Wren. So in talking about the birds, it's, so this dude showed up like early on and nested down in a little box. And I was absolutely like, all right, you can see it's a berry box. And um, oddly enough, right behind it is the former Potatoes for Sale West Town School farm sign. And I thought it was appropriate. I thought it was a cute picture at the time. But then she kept coming back. And so the next year she came back and she nested in the, the wheel, the well. Shield for the weed whacker. The shield right? for the weed whacker. And um, so we didn't know what to do because it was spring. We had the weed whack and uh, she was stuck in there. Well, the next morning we come in and Lisa Keisha, her, her conservation director, had wrapped police tape around the entire <laughs> corner. And this is not a joke. <laughs> And with a sign, do not touch until fledglings hatch. <laughs> and um, we couldn't weed whack. Uh, and I, because none of us are going to mess with police on that. <laughs> and uh, so, but you know, it, it is interesting right now up in the farm shed, within five feet of each other, we have a robin with um, chicks and a barn swallow with chicks. And so, you know, the farm is alive. And I think traditionally, farms have kind of not to be harsh, but eradicated nests. And I think for us, we the understand the bird conservation program has given us really recognize the importance of really, what is that? Um, <laughs> we got some weird noises going on. Um, of, of respecting the integrity of the wildlife around us. So, and then with that, you come with the rodents. Um, this cute little bunny is actually can be one of our biggest problems. And I was picking peppers one day, and it was when my dog Max was still around. And Max was going after this guy, and he just jumped in, and I couldn't help. So we but, gave him out with the CSA. Yeah, so we, so we put him to the CSA share. Um, have a pepper or a bunny. <laughs> no, so, but I mean, this is the reality. I mean, obviously, we took that guy, and we let him loose. And I think Max got him the next day. But um, it, it just is, this is what we deal with. And we don't want to be killing. We don't want to be eradicating things. We're just trying to encourage what is a natural life system, which is the ecosystem that exists here. And that brings us to the bees, a major part of the ecosystem of Russian farm. <laughs> sure. Uh, we have, we have Right now, I think we have almost seven or eight colonies. This year was um, a very big swarming season, or that's also, that's what we call the reproductive um, cycle of the honeybees. And the slide you saw a few slides ago was a cluster of bees that had left the colony. So within that cluster was the queen that made it the winter and all the foragers or some of the foragers who have been out of the colony before. And what they'll do is they'll divide their tribe once uh, the spring is assured to be in full swing and there's a plenty of to plenty of things blooming and a lot of nectar coming in. They'll initiate the reproductive process. So the queen that made it the winter and the foragers uh, will divide up, leave the colony and cling on to a tree. And it's really interesting, the scout bees that are typically out looking for new patches of clover or wondering when the black locust is going to bloom, they begin to visit different places to move. And once, in about, in about three or four hours or sometimes overnight, once those scouts come back to that cluster, do their bee dance and recruit other scouts to encourage them to look at the same spot that they've looked at, 
they reach a general consensus and all of them together move, that whole cluster will then move to another place. It might be a tree cavity six meters off the ground. It might be a unwitting hole in the side of a barn. It could be uh, some of my derelict bee equipment sitting somewhere <laughs> around the farm. It's, it's very interesting, but, but that's basically how they reproduce is that swarm. And, and that picture was interesting because one of the things we've missed this season is um, having kids groups out and engaging with them. And about the second year I was here, I was actually in the middle of a bee talk and Fred casually walked by and said, yeah, the bees are swarming. And so myself and the kids got to watch this mass of bees fly away from the apiary and all aggregate and land on that bush. And the, the kids were just tickled. And I think they were late middle school. And I always remember one, one child goes, dude, this is going to go viral on YouTube. Why he take, why he take me on my, his uh, cell phone. So the bees have always been a great educational component and people are always really interested. And I, I see how um, the honeybees really are a, uh, a sort of a, a mile marker or a trail sign for people to become interested in pollinators and insects and um, the way that they uh, react with the world around them. And, and just, just to end, I'll say that, you know, the, the honeybees that we have on the farm, uh, they're native to Europe. But they only really pollinate about a third of our crops. Um, you know, raspberries, cucumbers, watermelons, winter squash, for example. But all of our tomatoes, peppers, um, things like that, they're pollinated by the wild bees. Uh, there's not really enough nectar in those flowers for the honeybee to be bothered by them. But they really are attractive to all the native pollinators. So the native pollinators really do a lot more pollinating on a whole than the honeybees do on a farm as diverse as ours. And so, you know, I really do encourage people to try to maintain a natural bee habitat. You know? And that leaves us to remember the pollinators. Oh. So uh, we're going to go into some of the education and what we do, which is, this is Ben Renard on the bottom. Ben was our first Penn student who came out here and he did a, uh, he wanted to figure out what Bees were on the property, um, or on the farm. He, uh, he basically came out here, he captured bees, and um, at the end of his study, he had captured 49 different species of bees. And this is the understanding that Noah was just talking about, which is the, the, the pollinators are they're so far beyond what we actually think of as traditional pollinators, that the honeybee is the pollinator. We have so many pollinators, and the bees being the foremost, but the native bees. And for this, for his first study, I was able to take that to other farms and say, this is why you can't spray pesticides. You're not just killing all the pollinators, you're killing all the bees that are out there, and you might be getting some of the negative insects, uh, the pests that are out there, but you're killing what's actually making your crop survive. And this is the basis of what we do with our studies. And we've had a really good collaboration with University of Pennsylvania over the years with having students come out and do capstones based on the studies that they're doing at the farm. We then can take that, use that to create our own um, narrative on why we farm the way we do and why we need to farm the way we do. And then I can take that to conferences, to other farms, to other people, and it's ongoing. It's like any scientific study. It's long, it's hard, it's arduous but it's important because that work in the end is what defines a model for modern agriculture. And I just want to say, so somebody who committed herself so entirely was Katie Flammer, um, who came out here every weekend because weeds are seasonal just like plants are seasonal. She wanted to really study everything that wasn't directly in the crops. Um, and so she looked at all the different weeds plants, grasses all around the farm, and even the stuff in the fields, the thistle, um, the invasives that were in there, and really did this complete study of the natives and the non-natives that were affecting the farm and how it was doing that. That was the second biggest study that I think was done out of all the Penn students, simply because it let me know that we have far more invasives in our farm fields than around the farm fields. So then I can go to the farmer and say, you're spraying pest, uh, herbicides all over your side fields, 
But in reality, you need to be concentrating more on what's actually happening on in your own fields because the plants that are growing in there, the invasives that are in there, are far more toxic than the stuff that's around the fields. And in that way, you can encourage them to create a habitat system around the farm by not mowing, by maintaining it, where birds and insects can exist and help the farm uh, to produce. And that's where we end. Um, it's, uh, for, for me, this is the picture I miss the most. Um, there's uh, Max running with a bunch of kids after him, uh, the original farm dog. And uh, these are scenes that I hope come back soon. Um, we miss the kids here, we miss the activity. Um, and, uh, but for right now, we're in a virtual sense and we're really trying to promote that because I do think this is a medium that we can reach out to. I think that tonight with different things going on, uh, we're kind of testing things out still. Don't laugh at me, Kate, when you're getting yeah, your you. Um, the, but you know, this is something that I'm hoping that we can take out into the field and be able to show you plants growing and we get the kitchen going again, being able to show you producing food. I really do think going forward, this is going to be something that we're going to be concentrating on more. Um, and with that, oh, there we are. Did you, oh, oh, I didn't realize there was another one. Are you missing a slide? No. Lost. This was the last one, maybe, maybe not. Maybe a live. There we go. Hey, all right. Uh, so the lunch and learn. The next uh, virtual event we're gonna have is so like all and um, Mike Cranny, and they're gonna be talking about native plants. And Sarah Hutchin is our queen yeah. of native plants here at Rushton Farm. Um, and we just had a fantastic sale of native plants that we're going to be expanding next year. Um, listen to uh, Mike and Blake talk about um, really what is important to your landscape, what is important to your garden um, when it comes to native plants. Um, it's, it's a very vital part of maintaining a landscape without having invasives and really promoting um, what is natural within your ecosystem. Um, with that, I think we're at time. Anybody have any questions? I looked at you when you gave me that with, with, with that, <laughs> just to make sure that was Different actually it. <laughs> there we go. Um, Fred, it's Meg. Hey. Um, go over the, um, what you do as far as keeping the deer away again, just for a quick second. I missed a, I missed a little bit of it. Okay, so we play Grateful Dead music really I loud. So. <laughs> and, uh, no, uh, so we have, um, we take fencing down every year. The deer, it, originally when Russian Farm was established, the idea was that we were thinking about putting 12 foot fencing all the way around. And none of us liked that idea and really felt that that was not welcoming for a nature preserve. So, we started deciding how to fence off individual pieces of the ground with electric fencing and putting up, um, do it, baiting it. So it was electric fencing, you put peanut butter on it, um, they come in, we put it up in March, they come in, lick the peanut butter bait, move off. And then you take it down at the end of the season so they can move through. The, uh, because if they start in the winter jumping that fence because the only green stuff around is what's left in there. Right now they've got 85, 86 acres to feed off of. Um, but in the winter, they're definitely gonna be jumping that fence. If they learn to jump that fence, then they're continuously going to do that. Um, so that's the goal is to really train them and it's worked for us for the last 13 years. Yeah. And the one last thing I have a question about, are you sure that was a box turtle and not a tarpon? Hey. <laughs> hey. Hey, what's it mean if this farmer has a six pack in the tractor with him? <laughs> it means he already drank the other three six packs. <laughs> <laughs> That's my um, farmer happy hour joke. I do want to send one last thing out to, uh, I, I meant to promote with, Depending on whether this becomes a regular thing, uh, a farm and a brewery, because I rely on both. Uh, I want to thank Deer Creek Malt House for providing us with uh, the brew we're drinking tonight. And I also want to just give a shout out to our homeland, uh, which is Pete's Produce Farm. And um, I suggest you go out there. They got their strawberries going. The corn's going to kick up uh, by July 4th. 
And um, that's where Noah and I both, uh, Noah earned his. That's where Fred and I met. Yeah. A long so, time ago. Um, together. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. I'm feel, I've got a question that came in from the chat. Um, it's uh, somebody asking, love what you guys are doing at the farm. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> any tips for regenerative agriculture for smaller backyard gardening? Yeah, so um, the first thing is limited tillage, which can be done with just a pitch, a fork. You can just fork your soil more um, and making sure that any amendments you add for a backyard garden, um, composting is great. Um, just make sure you're not adding like the miracle grow and, and chemicals that may look organic in some cases, but aren't. Um, it, it's, it's gross when you have to pour fish emulsion on your stuff. It doesn't smell nice, but man, I, it's, it's the best thing for your plants. And uh, no, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I, you, know, you know what I think is a is really nice way to go is um, the, the boxed beds or the mm -hmm. raised beds because it, it, it defines, um, once you do that once, it defines your aisles and your beds or it really sort of defines what your garden space is. And then like Fred mentioned, you don't have to pay someone to till or get out there with the tiller yourself. Oftentimes with a raised box bed like that, it's very easy to turn it over with a fork and you can use a little bit of cover crops in the fall. Um, if, you're, if it's early, you can do something that'll winter kill like oats so you don't have to try to get that rye down in the spring, but rye works good too. And then uh, compost and um, leaves in the fall um, when you're raking your leaves around your house and uh, you know and know your environment I mean a lot of people have a lot of trees and shade so that's great for growing lettuces and herbs and things that you would want in your kitchen garden throughout the summer and you know you can let the pros at the watermelons and the winter squash mm -hmm. and things like that so even here at the farm we really try to we say we want to farm smart like we just we, we really want to see like what crop is going to do well where and try to concentrate on that and 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 you know realize that we can count on other people especially during the season for some of the other vegetables that maybe be take up too much space or be too difficult to grow in a home garden mm -hmm. yeah and the and the one thing i really love about home gardens and small spaces is extending your season into the winter if you can get some kale established i know it's hot but if you can get some kale established in your garden in July and August that, you know, that, that will grow and provide the household with great food all the way through almost December with just a little piece of plastic over it. So one of the virtues of the home garden is really getting stuff early in the spring before us farmers have it and extending your own kitchen garden by, by doing that second planting in July so that you'll have things well into uh, the winter and plant garlic. Garlic's great. You can put it in your perennial gardens. You know, you plant a bulb or you plant a clove and you get a bulb. You plant a clove on uh, Columbus Day and you get a bulb on the 4th of July. So really, even if you don't have a, a regular garden and you have a few perennial beds, something like garlic is a great crop because it lasts. And that's one of the things we really like is garlic and potatoes because during the season, we may eat stuff in the field, but we don't really have time to cook all the gourmet meals or use the produce like we would like. So things that store throughout the winter are really valuable to us farmers because that's when we get to enjoy. Actually, <laughs> we, we don't eat till November. Okay. <laughs> How about that? There you go. Too much information. <laughs> Ooh, we got too much. And that's the Deer Creek talking. <laughs> um, all right, we got a couple more questions coming in. First one: uh, What are you planting in June or July? Molly? Uh, <laughs> it is June, right? <laughs> it is June. It, it, it depends on whether you're talking about direct seeding or yeah. plants. So I, I said so much of our stuff has started in the greenhouse early on um, that we're putting stuff in the ground that was seeded in March. But so our big our big plantings coming up, we can say that like we have our we just got our second round of tomatoes in this week. We got our eggplant in this week. Next week is our melon fields, or cantaloupes and watermelon. Um, that's the big stuff. What? Oh, the fall crops. Oh, yeah. We just seeded all of them. We just sorry, yeah, yeah. That Noah's whispering to me. <laughs> what did we do this week? We seeded um, within like the last uh, end of last week, early this week. We seeded 
in the greenhouse. So we're still seeding things, uh, you know, as the season goes on, we can't forget that just the stuff that we already started, we have to keep starting things. So we did our, our leeks last week, we seeded those in the greenhouse. This week we seeded our Brussels sprouts um, and our um, Romanesco. So that, that's, those are, they came up, they germinated pretty well. So uh, as long as we get them in the ground in time, hopefully we'll have another good Brussels sprout, um, Brussels sprout year. But there's also direct seeding and that's direct going seeding, on. We'll, you know, hopefully get some, um, some more green beans in and soybeans that's on the list. Um, some, some salad greens, hopefully uh, soon also on the list. Um, yeah, we're, we're in the thick of it right yeah. now. You know, like that, that uh, this year, this part of the year is really interesting because we're, we're be ending the big spring plantings, but we're also starting to pick off the stuff that we first planted, like the broccoli, uh, the peas will be coming in a week or two. And we're planting our hot season or long season crops or the tropicals, like your tomatoes, your peppers, eggplants, which we're not trying to get early. We just want a really good crop. So we wait till the nighttime temperatures come up and the soil's warm and the weather is settled down a bit to put those in. But it's always interesting in this farming game because really what we're thinking about now for the future is the fall already. Yeah, so it's I, really interesting like that. It is, I also, we are, we seeded our winter squash um, beginning of last week, week, week or two ago. And it is, it's, it's really, every year it catches me, like how, how are we planting winter squash? Um, you know, and it's, it, it's barely summer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an interesting thing, like even for me in the five years, I've learned so much and, um, and there's so much that people can learn about where your food comes from and so many things that we just take for granted um, so it's really interesting to really learn the cycle and learn this, the system and how um, continuous and uh, I mean, just how much goes into it. Mm -hmm. So uh, next question, what herbs or annuals would you plant to attract the most beneficial insects? Mm. Is it the most, I will go with most beneficial? Yeah. <laughs> Our bird conservation director, Lisa Keyshook's favorite scarlet runner beans are magnificent magnificent for that um pineapple sage I, it just in terms of the flowering stuff um it's uh you know you really want something that's going to have a long bloom and be able to pull them out we go back to what else uh you know, fred's you know, fred's you got it there like what's great for the pollinators see what happens after at least for from the beekeeping perspective is what happens soon we're right now we're in what's called the surplus the surplus honey flow or the nectar flow like you look around there's a lot of stuff blooming but once we get past july 4th say there's not much stuff blooming so all of your herbs that produce volatile oils like uh, lavenders sages um, things like that the composites that bloom in late summer or midsummer they're really great for beneficial insects because they'll provide a little bit of um, nectar and pollen but also the essential oils that they produce really help them with hive health, whether it's like bumblebees or solitary insects or even um, honeybees themselves. Like a lot of the medicinal herbs that humans use, the same chemical constituents and volatile oils are also good for the insects themselves. And it gives them something to do in the middle of the summer while they're waiting for the goldenrod uh, the, the asters just, you know, your fall bloom to start. And, and that's the big thing is it's the midsummer. I mean, we lose so many blooms from the beginning, from the spring until the fall when we have the late blooms and be able to have uh, a source for the pollinators to go to is important. And I think that's why we talk about some of the plants that we put in that actually bloom in July and August. And that's all I have from the chat. Okie doke. <laughs> well, with that, I think we're right on time. I do want to say again, um, I, I really get outside. It is a different season right now. Life really is moving. It feels different. We're seeing a lot of different stuff, be it from turtles to insects to snakes. And the um, lightning bugs awesome. right now. Lightning like, bugs yeah. are, it looks yeah. like they. End of a dead show, right before the on. <laughs> you know, all the little lights are flashing right, right, right at sunset in the fields, especially on you know closer on, on the preserve sites where there's a lot of 
acreage to look at. So, so definitely try and get out to one of our preserves, Ashbridge, Kirkwood, or Rushton. And with that, uh, I just want to say, everybody, stay safe, stay safe, stay well. We hope to see you again really soon, and just be grateful for everyone around you. Because right now, I think we've really learned that that's important to to really recognize the people you love and the people who are important to you. And I have a great group around me. Yeah. Even if they're creative writing skills. I'm <laughs> going to be hearing that one in the field for a while. I want a sci-fi story. I'll bring, my, I'll bring my poems to workshop tomorrow. <laughs> you can regale us with poetry in the field when things get We have a lot of content for tonight. <laughs> All right, guys. So thanks so much for joining us. Yay.